Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Join me, Lawrence Fox, on GB News. Frank, fun, fearless and sometimes serious, much as I love a Friday night punch-up, what I really want is a battle of ideas. I want to look at things differently. I want to hear different voices and engage with your unique experiences. Every Friday at 7 p.m. on GB News. I'm Michael Portillo. Join me on GB News on a Sunday morning for topical discussion, debate, arts and culture, and sometimes even ethical dilemmas. I don't always agree with you, Michael. <laughs> Michael Portillo, Sundays on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes & Co. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes & Co. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. There's a guy who went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Very good morning. Welcome to Bev Turner today on GB News. Thank you for choosing us. Today is the day to be careful. 25,000 ambulance workers and call handlers have walked out across England and Wales today. Long waits for 999 and 111 calls are expected. There will be fewer ambulances on the road. Is there any movement on negotiations? We will find out. Sam Lister and Mike Parry will be here to go through the day's biggest stories and I want your opinions too, of course. I'm also going to be handing out this morning my prestigious Turner Prize before 11. It's an award that goes to someone who fights for freedom and speaks out against censorship. I'm going to be joined live from New York by one of the founders of Restore Childhood. They've been fighting for the well-being of children during the pandemic and they want to help them get their lives back to normal. Don't miss that. That's all coming up after a look at the latest news with Tatiana. Bev, thank you very much. This is the latest from the GB Newsroom. Thousands of ambulance workers across England and Wales are going on strike today in a dispute over pay. Health unions have announced that they won't submit evidence to the NHS pay review body for the next wage round, while the current industrial disputes remain unresolved. Up to 25,000 paramedics 
drivers and call handlers from the Unison and GMB unions are taking part in staggered walkouts across a 24-hour period. A further day of action is planned for the 23rd of this month. Health Secretary Steve Barclay told GB News that despite contingency plans, there will be an impact on patient responses. To people, if they do face genuine life threatening uh, issues, then of course the response is to phone 999. But uh, if not, then to be very mindful of the pressure on the system today. Clearly, there's 111, which is there for urgent calls. We were just asking people to be mindful of the significant pressure our ambulance service will be under today. Teachers in Scotland are on strike for a second day today after last-ditch talks failed to find a solution. Secondary schools across Scotland will be closed following primary schools being shut yesterday. The Scottish Teaching Union has demanded a 10% pay increase, but the Scottish Government only offered 5%. The Labour Party will initiate a vote in the House of Commons to try to end private school tax breaks in place of recruiting more teachers. The party will use an opposition day motion to establish a new committee that would investigate reforming tax benefits used by private schools. It says the money saved by scrapping private school tax breaks would be used to recruit an additional 6,500 teachers and prevent those leaving the job. Shadow Education Secretary Bridget Phillipson told us she doesn't think it's justified that private schools enjoy tax benefits. I know that parents want the best for their children and if they choose to send uh, their children to private school, I'm not going to criticise individual parents for doing that. I just don't think it's right um, that private schools enjoy business rates relief and I don't think it can be justified that the, the VAT uh, reliefs that they enjoy and the tax breaks that they see. And This for me is about making sure that we are raising money to invest in our state schools. The Foreign Secretary says the post-Brexit trading issues that undermine Northern Ireland's place in the UK must be addressed. James Cleverley will meet with Northern Ireland's party leaders in Belfast today to discuss the impact of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Mr Cleverley, along with the Northern Ireland Secretary Chris Heaton, will also speak about the stalemate within Stormont. Broadcaster and journalist Eamon Malley told GB News he's doubtful that today's talks will amount to much. I suspect that the British government and the European administration will engage in some are, are using some of the mechanisms used during the making of the Good Friday Agreement, constructive ambiguity. A bit of a fudge here and a bit of a, of a fudge there. There can be no absolute answer. No matter what happens, what changes take place, trade with Europe uh, uh, will be subject to the European Court of Justice. The European Court of Justice it governs all of the European Union when it comes to trade. The Prime Minister and his Japanese counterpart will sign a landmark defence agreement today that will allow the UK and Japan to deploy forces into each other's countries. The treaty which Rishi Sunak and Fumio Kishida will sign will make the UK the first European country to have mutual access with Japan. It's part of a foreign policy tilt towards the Indo-Pacific region against a growing threat from China. The government is calling it the most significant defence agreement between London and Tokyo in more than a century. Six people have been attacked at the Gare du Nord train station in Paris by a man with a knife, leaving one person with major injuries. Police have secured the area following the incident which happened at around 6.45 local time this morning. Officers have said the attacker was shot several times by police and taken to hospital with life-threatening injuries. The motivation, though, is not yet known. And a charity claims at least 271,000 people were recorded as homeless in England last year. Shelter says that figure includes people in temporary accommodation, hostels and those on the streets. It estimates 45% of those were children. London had the highest rate, with around 1 in 58 people homeless, with people in the northeast least likely to be without a permanent home. The organisation says it's bracing for further spikes in homelessness this year. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Bev.
Good morning and very warm, warm welcome to Bev Turner today on GB News. Here's what's coming up on the show this morning. Uh, around 20,000 members of the two largest ambulance unions in England and Wales started a 24-hour strike at midnight. It's an ongoing dispute about pay. Unions and NHS bosses have agreed that all Category 1 emergency calls will get an ambulance. Nevertheless, we're going to cross over to a picket line in Lincoln in just a moment. And today I'm going to be talking to uh, an amazing, inspirational woman, actually, Natalia Murakeva. She's in New York. She's going to be receiving the inspirational, uh, sorry, the, <laughs> the, the important Turner Prize. Uh, it's an award given to those who fight for the underdog, stand up for freedom or speak out against censorship. She's the co-founder of an American charity called Restore Childhood. And she's going to tell us, actually, that there are still restrictions on the lives of American children due to COVID. And to go through some of the biggest stories of the day, I'm going to be joined in the studio by the political editor at the Daily Express, Sam Lister, and the broadcaster and journalist, Mike Parry. One of the stories we're going to be talking about, actually, is about the Shamima Begum podcast. We trailed it uh, a little while ago, if you remember. Well, it's out this week. I want to know what they think about that. And I also want to know what you think about that. We're asking you, should the BBC give Shamima Begum a platform to tell her side of the story in this new 10-part podcast. Email me, gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews to have your say. So thousands of ambulance staff have walked out this morning in an ongoing dispute over pay. NHS managers are already warning that patient care will be far worse during this industrial action after the government failed to complete a national deal for emergency cover. Our West Midlands reporter, Will Hollis, has the story. It's a sound that will comfort some and concern others. But today, no matter the feeling, fewer sirens will be heard on the road. For the second time in less than a month, thousands of ambulance workers in Wales and England are on strike. Despite crisis talks between the Department for Health and union leaders at Unison and GMB on Monday, the walkout couldn't be stopped. At the heart of the dispute, pay. While visiting a hospital in London yesterday, the health secretary spoke of how it wouldn't be appropriate to return to last year's pay review, but didn't rule out backdating pay in the next. The key focus of the meeting was to look at next year's pay review body uh, and the evidence that we submit to that. We want to work constructively with the unions in terms of the evidence that is submitted there. But of course, as part of that meeting, we also listened to the trade unions in terms of their concerns. Only the most serious of emergencies, including cardiac arrests, will be responded to today. Individual ambulance trusts have agreed a basic level of service with unions but the government has criticised leaders for not setting a national standard. Now new legislation has been introduced in Parliament by the Business Secretary aimed at securing a minimum level of safety. A lack of timely cooperation from the ambulance unions meant employers could not reach agreement nationally for minimum safety levels during recent strikes, and health officials were left guessing Absolutely. at the likely minimum coverage, making contingency planning almost impossible and putting everyone's constituents' lives at risk. In a response, Unison's General Secretary, Christina McNear, said, Ministers should be putting all of their energies into solving the NHS dispute, not worsening relations with health workers. Unions want to work with the government to secure a pay deal, but attacking workers makes that much harder. Despite the industrial action, health bosses are encouraging you to call 999 for serious emergencies. If you have a life-threatening illness, you must ring 999. Your call will be answered by an experienced call handler. They will assess you. And if you need an emergency ambulance, you will receive an emergency ambulance. With little hope of a deal to end the action now, more ambulance strikes are planned for within the fortnight. Will Hollis for GB News. Thank you, Will. Uh, I think Will is going to uh, join me now. Um, are you there, Will Hollis? I believe our East Midlands... There you go. Hello, Will. Um, so, we just heard that, uh, your report there. A lot, of it, a lot of this is about pay, but are, they, are the uh, strikers also talking about working conditions as well? Yes, very much so. That's what I'm hearing. This morning on this picket line here in Lincoln, you can see behind me there is around uh, a dozen or so ambulance workers, paramedics, as well as 
the union members from GMB, which is the particular union that's on strike uh, for the East Midlands Ambulance Service. Of course, the big thing that you hear about with any of these strikes is pay. But really what I've been hearing from people today is that they got into this job because they want to help people. And right now they can't do that because waiting times to get into hospitals uh, are quite bad. Also, different forms of abuse that they might get from people while they're trying to help them isn't uh, particularly good when you're trying to do a job that's designed at saving people. Of course, today, the big, uh, the big information that health bosses will want you to know is that you can still get an ambulance for Category 1, so that's for anything like cardiac arrest, but depending on where you are in the country, depending on what ambulance service uh, is serving your area, it might be patchy depending on what you need. So, of course, the advice is to go to 111 um, as well as online if you uh, are unsure as to how you might be able to get an ambulance. But um, I will say, just a few moments ago, some of the people from the picket line left the picket line. They jumped in one of the ambulances behind me and they zoomed off along this road in Lincoln and I asked one of the people what was that for and they did say it was a cardiac arrest. So, certainly, while you might see people on picket lines, they're leaving the picket lines to come out to those the most serious of emergencies today. OK, thank you, Will. Will Hollis there uh, in Lincoln. And apologies if, if the sound w was difficult there. You, of course, all those horns beeping are people driving past in support of the ambulance workers. Let me know if you are also in support of them. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Now, another story that uh, caught my eye this morning, because I'm always on the lookout for stories which affect the motorist. Uh, it's good news for petrol car drivers. Fuel prices have fallen from extremely expensive to slightly less expensive. In some areas, the average price at four courts has fallen below £1.50 a litre for the first time since Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, Howard Cox is the founder of Fair Fuel UK. Good morning, Howard. Uh, lovely to see you. Now, why have these fuel prices finally fallen? Morning, Bev. Nice to be on your show. Um, yeah, I, what's happening is the oil price has been, uh, well, it's plummeted in the last uh, uh, sort of uh, two or three months. And at last, they're, they're catching up uh, the uh, uh, fuel supply chain. Uh, but we're still seeing pump prices really 10 to 15p higher than they should be. Uh, they're still coining in a huge amount of profit. The profiteering is, is actually epidemic. Uh, and it's worse even with diesel. Why, Howard? Well, it's a, it's a long story, but our refining capacity in the UK in the last decade has come down. Something our refineries have halved in terms of the number of them actually doing the job. And therefore, with demand, actually, you know, with the economic demand and more use of, and we were told to drive uh, diesel, as you know, uh, we have to import diesel from overseas. And of course, uh, the, the uh, speculators who actually treat diesel as a commodity uh, are actually uh, keeping the price high to maintain profits if not increase profits. Let me give an example. Um, something like uh, up until 2019, the average profit per litre for petrol and diesel was around about 8 to 12 pence per litre. That's right across, you know, oil companies, right the way down to the garage, etc. Mm -hmm. But now there's something like 25 pence per litre. Now, why? Why do they need more profit in a situation where the energy crisis is rife and the cost of living crisis is crippling so many people, including those strikers? Because, of course, diesel was always considered to be the cheaper fuel, right? And that was one of the reasons why we were encouraged um, to have diesel cars. It seems to be a little bit more economical, perhaps, in the pocket. Is nobody keeping an eye on this for us, Howard, like, apart from you? Are there, are there no politicians who are making a fuss about this and holding these, these petrol companies to account? To be fair, sir, there's a lot of backbench MPs, uh, Tory MPs. Uh, they wrote a letter just before Christmas to Jeremy Hunt, um, 30 of them, led by Jonathan Gullis, Stoke-on-Trent North MP, and also supported by Priti Patel, Andrea Leadsom, and many others. And there's, there's a lot more in the backbench who wrote to the uh, Jeremy Hunt to ask call for our what we've been calling for, and I've come on your show before, for a body called Pump Watch, a, a pricing regulatory body. We've got it for, off, uh, for gas and yeah. electricity and telephone communications. We haven't got it for 37 million motorists. And all we're asking for is a fair and transparent approach to the pricing of fuel. If it was fair and transparent, and we have pump watching, we'd be seeing pump prices 10 to 15p even lower. And guess what? Don't forget, in the March budget, we've got that 
incredible 23% uh, rise in fuel duty expected, which was not trumpeted at the last autumn statement, but the OBR came out with it the day later. Did you see yesterday, Howard, we were talking about the fact that um, driving an electric car, surprise, surprise, is now just about as expensive <laughs> as driving a combustion engine car. How do you greet news like that from Fair Fuel UK? Well, we're not surprised. Now, and I, I must put uh, my cars on the table. I support electric vehicles, but what I want to do is not force us into driving them. As you know, in 2030, we got the petrol and diesel ban uh, scheduled to come in place, which is not in legislation, but we're told we've got to do it. You won't be able to buy a diesel or petrol car, a new one, uh, from 2030 onwards. Um, and we're not ready for it. And the interesting thing is I uh, commissioned a report by the CEBR, the Centre of Economic and Business Research, a very respected e economic a bunch of gurus who actually worked out that the cost of the uh, 2030 uh, ban of preventing us buying diesel and petrol cars will be five times more than the environmental benefit. Go yeah, figure. I can believe it. I, absolutely. Any tips, Howard, last question for motorists of how to shop around and get cheaper fuel? Is there any way we can, we can seek out the petrol pumps that's selling it at a, at a more reasonable rate? Well, I would use apps. I wouldn't drive around all over the place because all you're doing is using fuel uh, to get to these places. But I would use the very, like petrolprices.com, those sorts of places. And also the, the other thing to do is to sign up to fairfueluk.com, my campaign. I'm fighting like mad. I don't get paid for this. I've been doing it for 13 years. And all mm. that we need to do is we've got to get pump watch in place. We've got to stop this fuel duty rise and we've got to stop this 2030 ban. So there you go. That's what they can do. Brilliant. Thank you, Howard. You know I'm a supporter of what you're doing. Howard Cox there, the founder of Fair Fuel UK. Uh, let me know at home if you've seen the price of petrol coming down near you, gbviews at gbnews.uk. And uh, don't forget to vote in our Twitter poll this morning. We are asking you, as the BBC launch this podcast, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, but it comes out this week, uh, the Shamima Begum story, uh, to let her sell, tell her side of the story. Do you agree with the BBC funding this? Cast your vote now. Surprise, surprise, around 92% of you say so far that no, she should not be given this opportunity to explain herself. Also, send me an email, gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. I'm going to be talking about that story with my guests in just a moment, but also after the break. Due to the strikes, NHS England is urging patients to use NHS 111 online as a first port of call. Uh, but call 999 in a life-threatening emergency as well. Now, my panellists, Sam Lister from The Express and Mike Parry will give their take on that and all the other stories of the day. It's time for a break. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News.
Good morning, this is Bev Turner today on GB News. Now, my, my guests are here. We rushed in. I've got the very uncomfortable stool today, you two. No, I have. You have, Mike <laughs> Parry. No, you look all right from where I sit. Okay, so, Mike Parry's you. here. You yeah. all know him. Uh, journalist and, uh, you know, regular friend of the channel. Thank you. And also <laughs> Sam Lister, political editor of the Daily Express. Nice to see you guys. Right, Sam, let's start with um, front page of your newspaper <laughs> this morning. Sunak urged to get a grip and do a deal for Britain to finally end nurses' strikes. What's the Express saying? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're basically, we want both sides to just sort this out. You know, yeah. essentially, um, th th there's great public support for the nurses and, and the government's language is softening towards them. So, clearly, there's going to be some kind of resolution to this, but you might as well just get on with it and do it quickly. Mm. There's a, a two-day strike next week, and what we want is for, for both sides to sort this out ahead of that two-day strike, because obviously that's going to be very difficult for people who've got operations yes. planned and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, I had a long chat to Pat Cullen yesterday, the um, the General Secretary of the Royal College of Nursing. You did? Yes. Great. And what did she say? She was... I mean, she's, she's a... Um, you know, she's a very formidable woman, and she was basically saying, look, if we've got these strikes next week, you have to get round the table today, because hospitals put in place plans patients put in place plans. Mm. You can't pull this at the last minute, so you need to get this sorted out today, tomorrow. This has got to be... She's not a big fan of Steve Barclay, is she? No, but I think it's... What I've noticed is there's been a definite change in the position of the government. And if you notice today that, obviously, the ambulance strikers have gone out on work, uh, gone out on strike, mm. Health Secretary Steve Barclay, he, he's been making this very clear distinction about the measures that the nurse has put in place to make sure that patients are protected when they strike and the ambulance workers. And he's saying that they're putting lives at risk. He's making a very clear distinction between the nurses and the ambulance workers. So they, they're very aware that the public support the nurses. Yeah, and, and the nurses also will like that, yeah, right? He's yeah. casting them as taking a slightly moral high ground yeah. compared to the ambulance workers, I yeah. suppose. Mm. Um, what do you think, Mike? Well, uh, The urgency to sort it out is accurate, isn't it? Do you know what? I, uh, I spoke to Sam before we came in there and I questioned, I said, is the Daily Express now softening its position on these strikes in the public sector? Because it seemed to me like Sam's piece was edging towards Rishi's not doing enough or Rishi's yeah. not being tough enough, right? I do understand where you're coming from. There's great public sympathy for mm. nurses. So what you're saying is, can't the two sides get together yeah. and do it? But I think the element that sticks in my mind is the nurses started with 19%. Yes. Completely and utterly unreasonable. They're now floating a figure behind the scenes of about 10% and all that. So I think the general public have given a lot of consideration and time to the nurses' position. Mm. We do have uh, a soft spot for nurses, you're absolutely right. Mm. We all want it resolved, but what I don't want is for that desire to trip over into giving big public sector pay settlements because if the nurses get it, Everyone's that will be fodder it. for the other groups Absolutely. who are currently on strike. Did you get a sense from Pat Cullen what they would agree on? She, she, she was very clear. She said, we haven't just given an olive branch, we've given a tree. She, when she made this kind of suggestion that they would meet halfway, so halfway between 19% mm. and zero, you work, you work that out for yourself. Yeah. Um, that was a very strong hint to the government, look, we are willing to compromise on this 19%. We are not, you know, the 19% is that they'd set this kind of ratio where you, you factor in inflation plus this basic level. Um, so it's a flexible figure. They were willing to compromise on it. She said, without actually then putting proper figures on it and going into negotiations in public, you know, this is as far as we can go. And she says, it's a really big move from us to do that in public. And we've mm. had members on saying, you know, I hope you're not giving in and all that kind of stuff. She's taken quite a lot yeah. of flack personally. Yeah. And so she feels, look, we've actually given this big kind of gesture that we are willing to compromise. It's time for you guys to kind of put your... Um, I mean, the message I'd forward. like to come from that is not going from 19 to 10, but all other groups should now compromise on maybe halving their original demand. You know what I mean? Some of the other demands are for 10%, rail workers and that sort of stuff for 11%. If the nurses go for this, then they've, they've actually compromised in a way that they could say to others... You better yeah, do it see, too, because it's, it's well. not an yeah. endless pot of money, is it? No, and I think there is a special case to be made for nurses. Yeah. You know, we were out clapping on the doorsteps for them during the, the pandemic. They had a terrible, terrible time, mm. and we were all incredibly grateful for the work they did. They put their lives at risk. Mm. Now, the rail workers, it's a completely different case. I mean, the rail workers, they, they you know, they are refusing to modernise on working practices that are 100 years old. And yeah. they're very they, highly paid They're very to highly nurses. paid, and, uh, and you know... That, There's <laughs> much less public sympathy, Exactly. There? There's yeah. a lot yeah. more people get on a train train every morning, want to get to work, then necessarily yeah. go to hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
We've got to talk about Harry. I bet you're delighted <laughs> yeah. about this, aren't you guys? Mm -hmm. uh, more interviews, more, more facts from the book. Yes. What do you make of it, Mike Parry? Um... And by the way, I've got great admiration for the Express because I was a news editor there for five oh, no. years. And, so, I, so, and, so, uh, and I did my first ever work experience at did the you Express. Really? Oh, yeah, I've okay. got a big place in my Express family. There you go. So the reason I mentioned that is I'm moving on to another paper now, The Sun. I also work there, OK? Yeah. And the most stinging piece I have seen on Harry is from my old mate, Arthur Edwards. We right. all know who Arthur Edwards yeah. is. He's yeah. the legendary yeah. photographer. He's over 80 now, Arthur. Yeah. Yeah. I've known him in Fleet Street for years. His, the headline on his piece, I don't want to show it to the camera mm -hmm, there yeah. if you want to see it, but it, it actually says, Camilla stood up for lovely boy Harry, she does not deserve his revolting bile. That is the strongest I've ever yeah. seen Arthur say anything about a member of the royal family. He's remained neutral while covering them for 40 years. Yeah. But he said in the days when Harry was getting into trouble with things like wearing swastikas and all that, all Camilla ever, did, uh, Camilla ever did was try to be nice about him. Yeah. He's a lovely boy. Yeah. He's just a misunderstanding. Yeah. He's, he's very young. And Arthur is outraged that he's now going round the world Say, I mean, he says here things like revolting things, like Camilla wanted to leave the bodies lying in the road. You know, Arthur says, what a horrible thing to say yeah. about anybody, let alone your own stepmother well, and question, somebody who's helped you. The question you. that I feel this morning, I'm not sure whether Harry's read his own book. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I, I, you know what I mean? I because, don't think he has. Because, You're right. because, <laughs> because he's accusing the media yeah. of um, spinning this, the story of him uh, being involved in, in combat yeah. and killing yeah. uh, Taliban soldiers. Now, he said that quite publicly, this is not my fault, this, has been, this is causing a security yeah. risk. He's saying, this is putting my life at risk. Well, you said it, Harry. No, you no, can't he then says Sam said it. Yeah. Harry He's saying that it was Sam yeah. who said yeah, it. Yeah, it's your fault, it's your fault. Luckily, I don't have to cover the royals, and thank <laughs> goodness for that, you know. Mm. But I think with Harry, it is... All he, he talks in this kind of fluent therapy language, and it's all about accountability and transparency. But it's, it's always a one-way street, isn't it? It's mm. the press have to be accountable, his family have to be accountable. He doesn't seem to be accountable for anything. Yeah. You know, he made the palace essentially lie to the press about his drug taking, uh, and then he attacks the press for making up stories. Well, yeah. actually, you know, I, I have never made up a story in my life. So, mm. you know, I think this is, it, it, you is know, a it's a one-way street. At isn't the it? newspaper, like, is there a sense now that you're all going? Wow, we thought, yeah. we thought we'd told you what Harry was up to. We always knew he was a yeah. bit of a maverick character, mm. but we had no idea yeah. the stuff that he was actually up yeah. to. Yeah, and once he's put that all out there, there is no reason why anybody should ever, you know, stand back from these things. No. He, he has set the, the bar for the privacy levels that he's entitled to now. Yeah. And he doesn't really seem to realise that. And I just... No. I mean, part of me does feel sorry for him because clearly nobody's giving him good That's advice. Right. It, yeah. it just seems everybody's kind of leeching off him and it yeah. just feels quite terrible. Monetizing his trauma was yes. the word that the psychotherapist yeah. used. By the way, there are dozens of stories over the years, which I know personally we haven't published about yeah. Harry because yeah. of the respect for him as a member of the royal family. What happened to his mother yeah. has always been yeah. high in the head of newspaper yeah. editors. You know, yeah. we There's can't put the boy through too much trauma. Yeah. Yeah. And some of his behaviour in those years, yeah. his teenage yeah. years and early 20s, was terrible. And, yeah. and, and they might now come out. People are now actually saying, mm. you know, we might tell you a few stories about Harry. Your question, Bev, about has he read his own book, it is critical. <laughs> I've ghostwritten a couple of books for footballers, OK? Yeah. And I promise you, they, they read never them. read them. <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, do, you know, do you know how you can tell? They go onto a TV show and the interlocutor says to them, what about this? And their eyes glaze over. You know I, mean? I just call Mike, <laughs> Mike. <laughs> That's right, yeah, absolutely. And I'm certain Harry hasn't read the book. I mean, you'd yeah. think the last thing you would do is, here's the finished version, here's the manuscript, yeah. go through that with a fine red pen, Harry, yeah. and strike out anything you don't like. He clearly hasn't done that, has the he? Naivety of not knowing the lines that would be taken by the newspapers yeah. and Absolutely. used is quite. Where was his shocking. advisor? Yeah. Where was his media advisor? He should have sat down next to somebody who's worked in Fleet yeah. Street for thirty yeah. years, somebody yeah. the experience of yeah. Sam or somebody like that, yeah. mm. who should have said, "Are you mad? Yeah. Can't you see that this will blow up in yeah. your face?" Yeah. Nobody yeah. seems to have done that, yeah. and the reason why, of course, is the publisher and I understand what publishing's all about, yeah. will not have encouraged yeah. him no. to no, invite course. somebody in who might want to edit the book. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Right, guys, um, thank you so much. We've got more to come uh, in this... Uh, we've got another 90 minutes of the show left, so don't go anywhere. Uh, I'm going to be talking to uh, a really incredible woman in America in just a moment. She's been fighting for the rights of children and continues to do so because there are still, for instance, in some parts of America, still wearing masks in classrooms, all the COVID stuff. I'm going to be talking to her after your morning's news.
Bev, thank you. It's 10.32. I'm Tatiana Sanchez in the GB newsroom. Thousands of ambulance workers across England and Wales are striking today over pay. Health unions have announced they won't submit evidence to the NHS pay review body for the next wage round, while the current industrial disputes remain unresolved. A further day of action is planned for the 23rd of this month. Health Secretary Steve Barclay told GB News that despite contingency plans, there will be an impact on patient responses. Saying to people, if they do face genuine life-threatening uh, issues, then of course the response is to phone 999. But uh, if not, then to be very mindful of the pressure on the system today. Clearly there's 111, which is there for urgent calls. We were just asking people to be mindful of the significant pressure our ambulance service will be under today. Well, a rail union has warned its dispute is even further away from being resolved than when it started last year. Trade union leaders have appeared before the Commons amid and the ongoing strikes. The General Secretary of Aslef Union told the Transport Select Committee on a scale of 1 to 10, the resolution of the situation was at zero. RMT General Secretary Mick Lynch says he doesn't know if his members will accept profound changes to the rail industry. Six people have been attacked at the Gare du Nord train station in Paris by a man with a knife, leaving one person with major injuries. Police have secured the area following the incident, which happened at around 6.45 local time this morning. Officers have said the attacker was shot several times by police and taken to hospital with life-threatening injuries. The motivation is not yet known. And award season has kicked off in Los Angeles with the 80th Golden Globes overnight. The Banshees of Inisherin movie was the big winner with eight nominations. Steven Spielberg won Best Motion Picture for The Fablemans based on his own life story. He also won Best Director. Kate Blanchett won Best Actress for Tar, while Best Actor went to Austin Butler for his leading role in Elvis. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News.
Good morning. Welcome back to Bev Turner today on GB News. You've been sending me uh, your thoughts on the strikes. Richard has said strikes never work. They damage everybody. Uh, Lee said it's absolutely ridiculous. I'm working with people who can't eat and keep warm, and these people on upwards of £32,000 saying they can't survive. A criminal. It is Bev, says Lee. And uh, John has said, why are you not reporting the fact that ambulance workers in the east of England have voted not to strike? Surely this is good news. It is, John, and thank you for pointing that out to me. Happy to make that clear. We're also asking you on Twitter today about this new Shamima Begum podcast. Uh, her story from her side, basically, funded by the BBC. Do you think that's a good use of your funds? Let me know on Twitter. Overwhelmingly, more than 90% of you at the moment do not want to hear her side of the story. And Sharon has said, no podcast for a traitor. How dare the BBC? Pam has said she definitely should not be allowed airtime. Keep those views coming. GB Views at GBNews.uk or on Twitter at GB News. Now... This is a woman I've wanted to talk to for a little while. She's going to be speaking to us from America. It is, uh, she's also the recipient of my Turner Prize. This is an award I give to those who represent the values of this show, fighting for the underdog, standing up for freedom, speaking out against censorship. And my next guest certainly ticks all of those boxes. Natalia Morakova is the co-founder of Restore Childhood and joins us now. Good morning, Natalia. It's the very early in the morning for you there in America. Uh, yeah, that, good thank morning. You. Yes, it's, thank it's you. like 5.30 in the morning. Oh, well, thank you for getting up early. Lovely to talk to you. Now, tell us, what is Restore Childhood and why did you feel the need uh, to set up the charity? Um, Restore Childhood is a nonprofit organization that we founded about a year ago now to restore children's normalcy and fight back against unscientific mandates that have been plaguing kids across blue areas, which is, I, I know blue is different in the UK versus the US, but here, um, Democrat run areas across the country where we're still facing mandates and restrictions for kids. So explain to us what that looks like for you, Natalia, because here we think, well, you know, life has largely gone back to normal. Kids are at school, masks are not being worn. There are no van uh, vaccine mandates anymore. How is it there now? <clears throat> well, I live in New York City, so most of the mandates have, have largely gone away. The city and the state mandates, I mean, last year, kids couldn't even get into a restaurant in New York City or a show if they didn't have a vaccine card. And that started in December of last year, in 20, well, actually in 2021 now, um, and, and lasted through much of last year, um, and then extended to six-month-olds when we had um, six-month-old vaccines under EUA, um, but masks, masks were worn by children in schools up until June of 2022, so just about six months ago, for kids from 5 to 12, and for toddlers in New York City, um, and, and that's two and up, those children were masked the entire academic year last year, so from September through June of last year. Um, so it was it was it was just insane. Um, and and while these mask mandates have gone away and the vaccine mandates have gone away, many small businesses and theaters and uh, businesses that cater to children are still enforcing some of these mandates on their own. Um, and that's just New York City. California still has as you know some of these like spotty mandates in in democratic areas as well they brought back mask mandates for some college students here in upstate New York at SUNY Purchase, which is a state university of New York. They they brought back a mask mandate just a couple of weeks ago to keep kids safe, apparently, even though these kids were finally getting back to normal. Um, the state university of New York has a vaccine mandate for students, but not faculty and staff. Yes, that's true. Students, the ones who are the most the most vulnerable to the mandates and the least vulnerable to COVID. And now, most shockingly, uh, mask mandates have been brought back in really kind of like the poor urban areas around the country. So Camden, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, Sacramento, California has, has said that they, they would remask because they still have this crazy color tier system. Um, parts of Massachusetts, some of the par poorest parts. So it, it's not over. And now I, I don't know if the UK pre press is, is reporting it this way, but in the US, the press has really fallen in love with this term triple-demic. 
Um, and, and now they're talking about masking forever. So that would be yeah. for, in case you don't know what the triple demic is, it's RSV, um, COVID and the flu. Okay. When, I mean, I, I know, Natalia, it's so obvious to me why masks are a problem for children and why people like us have to fight to make it clear that children do not need to wear them. But just remind our viewers, in your research with your evidence-based um, analysis that you've now done for, for over a year, what are the disadvantages for children to wear masks? Well, number one, it's unpleasant. I mean, the fact is, like, there's a reason why we have a nose and mouth. And you remember Halloween masks always have those parts of your face cut out. So those are the parts that are open, not the parts that are closed. Um, so we've done, you know, many different initiatives. One of them has been uh, uh, helping organize a group called Urgency of Normal, which is a group of infectious disease and pediatric ER doctors and researchers across the country and in the UK and Canada. And there's not one shred of evidence that the these masks are even remotely effective when they've looked at two different school districts that are fairly comparable and looked at whether there was increased transmission in the mask optional school district versus the one with the mandate they really saw no correlation between transmission rate and mask wearing but children really need to be able to learn how to enunciate they need to be able to smile at people and have teachers smile back at them um, that's not happening when faces are masked and by the way while they're isn't a mask mandate going on for for anyone here in New York City right now most teachers at least in the schools that you know my kids go to are still masking so the the kids can't see how they move their mouths um, it's a huge disadvantage for people who are acquiring uh, English as a second language um, we've also spent time talking to the hard of hearing and deaf community and they feel like they've been left behind nobody cares they're 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 struggling if they're reading lips how yeah can they do that with a mask on? Um, speech therapy, I mean, so many areas are still forcing children to get speech therapy with a mask on. I mean, yeah. if that's not an oxymoron, I don't know what is. And sometimes here when, when I host discussions on masks to say that there is no evidence that they do any good and there's a lot of evidence to say that they do a lot of bad and people say, well, they've been, they've been wearing them in China for years and it hasn't done them any harm. And, and my answer to that is, I don't want to live in China. There's a lot about Chinese culture that I don't think we need to import here. And particularly... Uh, and how do they know? If, and how do they if, know how it do hasn't know? done them any harm? It's kind of like the people yeah. who were saying, you know, you guys had your schools open mostly we had schools in some areas closed for over a year and some people were saying my child is thriving in remote um, and, and all I kept saying was how do you know how do yeah. you judge that within a few months to come back to me in 10 years and let me know how your kid yeah. did after being locked in remote for yeah. over a year and then we can make that decision well, Natalia Marakova, I am delighted to say you are the recipient of the Turner Prize. You get a GB News mug. It'll, it'll cost me more to send it to you than the mug itself costs, but I am determined to do so. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you for what you're doing. If you want to find uh, the work of Natalia and the colleagues that she's with, it's Restore Childhood. Now, Thank trade you. union leaders have appeared before the Commons Transport Committee. All of the big players who can potentially bring an end to the rail strikes have come together, including RMT General Secretary Mick Lynch, TSSA General Secretary Frank Ward and ASLEF General Secretary Mick Whelan will appear. Let's get the latest uh, from Westminster with our political editor, Darren McCaffrey. Uh, good morning, Darren. What was said at the meeting? Who was present? And do we have any headlines about solutions? I don't think we're going to have any headlines about solutions. They are still very much examining the possibility of a deal, though that does not look particularly close. These were, as you say, the rail union leaders in front of the Transport Select Committee this morning in Parliament. When asked what they thought the chances of one out of ten were uh, that a deal could be arranged uh, or a solution, how close it was, uh, essentially the solution was that I think you conclude zero, apparently, in your one out of ten were further away than when we started. That was from the ASLEF. Uh, union chief uh, Mick Whelan, uh, copied up and followed by Frank Word, who said he wouldn't disagree. That was uh, the TSA's uh, union leader. Mick Lynch, though, said it depends on discussions and he wasn't going to use a scale. And he has been in talks with the Transport Secretary, Mark Harper, uh, today. There had been suggestions the government were looking at potentially upping uh, the amount of money they were willing to give 
rail workers to try and end this strike. But as I say, I think we're a long way from a deal. Let's have a listen in to what Mick Lynch, the head of the RMT union, the biggest rail union, had to say when he spoke in Parliament in the last hour or so. Under their current proposals, which are sponsored and put forward by the Department of Transport, there will be no ticket offices. And the last version of the offer that we had from the talks, there will be no guards either. So these are very stark choices. Plus, they want to uh, dilute um, all of our contractual terms and conditions virtually. So it's a very strong challenge for us. And this is completely directed by the government uh, in every element. Um, I don't know if any of our members will go anywhere near accepting those proposals. They are such profound changes that they'll be very difficult um, for any union to accept. OK, Beth. Uh, so as you can tell, uh, quite a lot of disagreement there between the unions and the current government position. And of course, it's not just the railway workers. Paramedics are out on strike today. Junior doctors may well follow suit. Teachers as well. I'm sure it's going to dominate Prime Minister's question time, the first one of the year in just over an hour's time, Bev. OK, thank you. Thank you, Darren McCaffrey there at uh, Westminster. Right, I'm back with my guest to go through the biggest stories of the day. Uh, broadcaster and journalist Mike Parry is here and also editor of the Daily Express, uh, political editor Sam Lister. Now, guys, we're going to be talking about this. We're, we're playing music. I don't know quite why. We're, we can burst into dance, maybe. Um, <laughs> so, listen, uh, Shamima Begum. She's been given this podcast by the BBC. Uh, her story, I'm just so much more than ISIS, she says. Um, Mike, what do mm. you think? Is there something to be learned? She was 15 when she went. Yeah. We need to hear what she's got to say. Well, Sajid David is not a, an extremist politician, in my view, but he made it very, very clear from the start, didn't he, when he was in a position to do so, no way will we ever welcome this woman back into our country. That's because, inherently, he realises that the background she's coming from is so littered with the potential of terrorism in the future, he thinks it would have been mad to have let her back in here because of the contact she will have made over the years. Now, the BBC podcast, by the way, it's not one podcast, it's a series of ten. Yeah. Not only that, there's a film to accompany it. A feature-length film will follow on BBC iPlayer. So I think the BBC are putting a bit of muscle into presenting the case until we listen to it. We don't know whether it's loaded one way or the other or, or straight down the middle. And it appears in The Times this morning, because The Times newspaper, in fact, found her uh, in the Syrian refugee camp. So they, they've both got interest in this story, but... Mm. I'm resolute uh, with Mr. Uh, with Sajid David from all those years ago. If even there's a 0.1% chance that when she comes here, it will give any sort of opening to any sort of possibility of future terrorist action, I'm afraid you've got to say to the young lady, you can't come, I'm sorry. What I find interesting, Sam, is the details that the BBC have leaked beforehand in order to promote it. And one of the things that they've said is that uh, she packed mint chocolate for her trip to Syria to join the brutal death cult, saying, I'm just so much more than ISIS. What a, what a kind of humanising insight. Yeah. Mm. It tells you how they're going to set this up. It is meant to be a PR exercise for her, isn't it? Well, the journalist involved, um, I think he's insisting it's a, a robust... It's Josh exam... Baker, I think yeah. his name is, the journalist who's made it, yeah. He, he's insisting it's a robust uh, analysis of what's actually happened in, in this story. And obviously it is a story of great public interest and people do want to know w what's going on yeah. with it, where, you know, w where we're up to with it. Um, and so, you know, there is nothing wrong with a journalistic exercise of investigating this story, but it's how you present it, isn't it? Mm. And the, the title is I'm Not a Monster, as you say, you talk about yeah. the chocolate. But, I mean, to be fair, she was a schoolgirl, so there is an, you know, there is an argument to look at whether she was um, groomed, kind of groomed, and, mm. and you know she was a child. So we do have to kind of Doesn't consider that. Doesn't that make her more dangerous? But, if, if, if she was 15 then, yeah. but she's grown in adulthood into this, couldn't she but, have? But what, have, I was, yeah. what I was going to go on to say. Sorry. Was, yeah. No, sorry. It was just former. Uh, I just thought it's worth uh, reading out what former Children's Minister Tim Lawton. Uh, who is, uh, again, he's not a kind of, you know, extremist, uh, mm. he's not on, the, on any, any radical wing of the Conservative Party or whatever, yeah. he's quite a, a moderate. But he said, and he's a children's minister, so, you know, he has a, a particular mm. perspective on this. And he said, public sympathy for Miss Begum when she first went missing was in, uh, increasingly, it's been replaced by outrage. And he, he says that many people are suspicious that she's now putting on an act 
Um, and he says, I think most people will say that, frankly, we owe her nothing. She got herself into this mess, and frankly, it's down to her to work out how she's going to get out of it. And so, you That's know... That's a very strong statement. It is. From somebody like Tim Lawton, that is a very strong we're looking, statement. We're looking on the screen now. Of course, this is the graphic that the BBC is selling the podcast uh, with. If you're listening mm. on the radio, it's a very glamorous picture of Shamima Begum. It's a sort of pop art yeah. with the made-up eyes. It's very Western. She's got a baseball cap, shiny mm. hair, eyelashes, eyeliner. The Shamima Begum story, I am not a monster. We are only allowed to draw one conclusion from this. Uh, do you think this is paving the way, Mike, to yeah. her being allowed back in? I, I do wonder. Well, it's paving it's the way for people to start changing their minds yeah. uh, because, as you quite say, that presentation there was rock and roll. Yeah. That could be in the front of a, a music, an, an album cover. Yeah, yeah, an album cover or something like that, you know. But what you've got to look back to are the. The history of her life is very tragic. You know, she was. She says that she was sold into sex slavery, that she had to marry somebody. Tragically, had three children, all of whom died. She's given birth it, 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 three, times three times, and, three, and lost died. those I mean, three children. And, and quite, is this unkind of me to say, for a woman who's had three children and lost three children, she doesn't seem to have any focus on that in her life. Well, her focus is only let me back into the UK. You see, to some extent, that's an argument to therefore listen to. To the podcast because we've all got a very strong opinion about her. Mm. Funnily enough, I don't have a particularly strong opinion, but I'm not going to mm. lie because I've seen, I've got, I've had, you know, I've got two children. One child has already been 15, I've got two almost 15. Mm. They think they know everything at 15, mm. right? Teenagers think they yeah. know everything, right? We're yeah. wrong about everything. So I can see that they are children, but mm. they think they are adults. Mm. I need to understand her story to have a better opinion. I don't feel like I've got an informed opinion. But I don't think her. we can give her the benefit of the doubt. Look at the terrorist incidents which have taken place in this country and caused terrible loss of life. Yes. And that's what I'm saying. 0.1% yeah. of doubt. Oh, she'll be all right now. Look, she's now re-accepted Western values. But... We don't think she's accepted them because she's changed her way of life. We think she's accepted them, so she looks glamorous yeah. when she's trying to draw our conscience and say, please let me back. Yeah. I, am, I would like to listen to it, though. Yeah. Would you, Sam? Well, I mean, you know, as a journalist, I want to listen to it with a exactly. very critical ear and make my own conclusion. And this is it. If, if the, if the BBC... Because I, I haven't listened to it, so I don't yeah. know. It's only if, out if, there. Yeah, if the BBC have, um, you know, been rigorous about this and, and treated it as a proper journalistic exercise, yeah. then that is actually, you know, for, for my mind, it's a, it's a worthy thing to do. It's just we, we need to... So far, what we've, we've heard is not actually... Do you know what? You know, thinking about it now and talking to you guys about it makes me concerned. Consider. I think the problem with it is it's the BBC. If an independent production company yeah, had set right. about yeah. going to, to do that, would feel yeah. appropriate. I think yeah. it's the fact that it's the taxpayers' money yeah. when it is so controversial, when the incontrovertible evidence is yeah. that she went to join a terrorist organisation against this country. Yeah. That, that's, that, I think that's yeah. my, the yeah. problem I have with it. This probably will be an independent production company, won't it? You know, within the BBC, but it'll be, it'll be yes. their people. But shouldn't the BBC, to dispel any sort of feeling that they're on her side and, and it's a propaganda it campaign, like. shouldn't, they, shouldn't they have a hearing of this with people like Sam there to mm. watch it, examine it and then mm. comment on it so yeah. that we get a much broader view of, of, of what their purpose yeah. was in making it? Yeah. Well, you've made it very clear what you think. Sharon says... No podcast for a traitor. How dare the BBC? Right, that's the end of our first hour. We've been, uh, we're going to be talking in the next hour about the Northern Ireland Protocol. We're going to be going over there to one of our reporters. But first, though, here's the weather. Hello, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. There will be some bright or sunny spells today, especially in the east of the UK, but more rain on the way for many in the form of showers or longer spells of rain mostly affecting western areas. We've got this strong westerly airflow at the moment. The strongest of the winds that we saw across the north of Scotland overnight are easing. The isobars opening out a little, but it stays blustery across the UK through the day, and that wind will bring in further heavy showers. Hail, thunder, a possibility, and some of the showers merging to form longer spells of rain, especially for parts of Wales in the southwest and then into central England by the end of the afternoon. Uh, best of any brighter spells will be towards the east, but even here there'll be some showers. And temperatures back to around average, eight or nine generally across England and Wales, five or six or seven for Scotland and Northern Ireland. 
into the evening, the rain ramps up again and the wind across Wales and the southwest in particular and around southwestern shores, coastal gales at 60 mile per hour wind gusts. A calmer and clearer night for northern Scotland where a frost will form minus three or minus four in some sheltered glens and a bright start for northern Scotland. Some showers in the far north here, but elsewhere a lot of cloud and further outbreaks of rain for Northern Ireland as well as Western Scotland through the morning and Wales in the southwest. Concerns here because of the large amount of rain falling on saturated ground, especially for Bracken Beacons and uh, Exmoor. Now the rain will move through, followed by showers. It's a mild but blustery day in the south. Temperatures closer to average further north. And uh, the rain as it pushes into central Scotland will fall as snow above 400 metres, perhaps affecting some higher routes. So it's cold for parts of Scotland and increasingly so heading into Thursday night. Milder further south, but all areas turning colder into the weekend with further heavy showers, but also some sunny spells. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me and the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. My name's Tom Harvard and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harvard, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's on it, she's on it. I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank, and of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4 pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Very good morning. Welcome to Bev Tennis Today on GB News. Thank you for finding us. Now, before midday, we're going to be in Belfast, where the Foreign Secretary is expected to meet with party leaders later today to discuss the impact of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Does that need sorting out or what? We're also going to look into excess deaths with statistician Jamie Jenkins and why NHS delays have been blamed for one of the most deadly years on record. Is that the full story? Uh, don't forget to let me know what you think of today's show. GB Views at gbnews.com. UK. That's all coming up after a look at the latest news. Bev, thank you very much. Good morning. It's one minute past 11. This is the latest from the GB Newsroom. Up to 25,000 ambulance workers across England and Wales are striking today over pay. Paramedics, drivers and call handlers from the Unison and GMB unions are taking part in 24-hour walkouts, as well as on the 23rd of this month. Health unions have announced they won't submit evidence to the NHS pay review body for the next wage round, while the current industrial disputes remain unresolved. Health Secretary Steve Barclay says that despite contingency plans, there will be an impact on response times. 
saying to people if they do face genuine life-threatening uh, issues then of course the response is to phone 999 but uh, if not then to be very mindful of the pressure on the system today. Clearly there's 111 which is there for urgent calls. We were just asking people to be mindful of the significant pressure our ambulance service will be under today. A rail union has warned its dispute is further away from being resolved than when it started last year. Trade union leaders have appeared before the Commons amid the ongoing strikes. The Aslev General Secretary told the Transport Select Committee on a scale of 1 to 10, the resolution of the situation was at zero. RMT's General Secretary Mick Lynch has told MPs the government is attempting to lower the wages of working people. He also says he doesn't know if his members will accept profound changes to the rail industry. Under their current proposals, which are sponsored and put forward by the Department of Transport, there will be no ticket offices. And the last version of the offer that we had from the talks, there will be no guards either. So these are very stark choices. Plus, they want to uh, dilute um, all of our contractual terms and conditions virtually. So it's a very strong challenge for us. Teachers in Scotland are on strike for a second day today after failing to come to a solution. Secondary schools across Scotland will be closed following primary schools being shut yesterday. The Scottish Teaching Union has demanded a 10% pay increase, but the Scottish Government only offered 5%. Six people, including a police officer, have been attacked at the Garde Nord train station in Paris by a man with a knife, leaving one person with major injuries. Police have secured the area following that incident, which happened at around 6.45 local time this morning. Officers have said the attacker was shot several times by police and taken to hospital with life-threatening injuries. The motivation is not yet known. The Labour Party will initiate a vote in the House of Commons to try to end private school tax breaks in place of recruiting more teachers. The party will use an opposition day motion to establish a new committee that would investigate reforming tax benefits used by private schools. It says the money saved by doing so would be used to recruit an additional 6,500 teachers and prevent those leaving the job. Shadow Education Secretary Bridget Philipson told us she doesn't think it's justified that private schools enjoy tax benefits. I know that parents want the best for their children and if they choose to send uh, their children to private school, I'm not going to criticise individual parents for doing that. I just don't think it's right um, that private schools enjoy business rates relief and I don't think it can be justified that the, the VAT uh, reliefs that they enjoy and the tax breaks that they see. And this for me is about making sure that we are raising money to invest in our state schools. The Foreign Secretary says post-Brexit trading issues that undermine Northern Ireland's place in the UK must be addressed. James Cleverley is meeting with Northern Ireland's party leaders in Belfast today to discuss the impact of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Mr Cleverley, along with the Northern Ireland Secretary Chris Heaton, will also speak about the stalemate with instalment. The Prime Minister and his Japanese counterpart will sign a landmark defence agreement today. It will allow the UK and Japan to deploy forces into each other's countries. The treaty will make the UK the first European country to have mutual access with Japan. It's part of a foreign policy tilt towards the Indo-Pacific region against a growing threat from China. The government is calling it the most significant defence agreement between London and Tokyo in more than a century. The Met Police says it will follow every avenue into the circumstances surrounding a package that was seized at Heathrow Airport with traces of uranium in it. It says a counter-terrorism investigation is now underway, but the amount of contaminated material was very small and there's no threat to the public. Border Force detected the substance in a routine screening of the item at the end of last month. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to Bev. Very good morning. Welcome back to Bev Turner today on GB News. Here what we've got for the next hour. 
The Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, will meet with Northern Ireland's party leaders today to discuss the impact of the protocol on businesses and trade. We'll have the latest from Belfast. And as the NHS delays continue to grow, over the past 34 weeks, we've had 19,000 more deaths than we should expect in an average year, particularly with the age group 35 to 54 mysteriously hit the most. I'm going to be speaking to statistician Jamie Jenkins about what might be going on. My panellists are going to be back for another hour as well. A political editor at the Daily Express, Sam Lister, as well as broadcaster Mike Parry. And of course, this show is much improved thanks to your contributions. Don't forget to vote in the poll on Twitter. This morning, we are asking you, with the release of the BBC podcast, uh, to give Shamima Begum a platform to tell her side of the story. Will you be watch listening to it? Should she be allowed this opportunity, courtesy of the BBC? Uh, do get on to uh, Twitter at GB News to let me know what you think. And GBviews at gbnews.uk is the email address. So first up, the Foreign Secretary will spend the day in Belfast addressing trading issues between Northern Ireland and UK. James Cleverly will join the Secretary of State, Chris Heaton-Harris, at a roundtable meeting with party leaders to discuss the impact of the Northern Ireland Protocol. So let's cross over to central Belfast and speak to GB News's Northern Ireland reporter, Doogie Beatty. Uh, good morning, Doogie. Good to see you. What's the situation in Northern Ireland currently? What a stalemate. Well, it's got worse in the last few moments, actually, because it wouldn't be round table talks without a drama in Northern Ireland. Sinn Féin's Mary Lou Macdonald is the president of Sinn Féin, but she's not elected inside Britain. She is a Tishy Doyler, a TD in the Republic of Ireland's government, and therefore has not been invited to these talks. Sinn Féin then are saying that we're not going into the talks if we cannot bring our president in with us. So James Cleverly arriving into a bit of a storm as even these talks start. But then he's got the other side of that. He said earlier on in the week that there had been movement between the EU and the UK over um, information being traded as what can come in and what can not come into Northern Ireland. Well, unionists are happy to see that there is talks and it is going forward, but they're unhappy that the TSS checks, though that paperwork that is there, because the checks themselves don't take that long, but the paperwork was costing Northern Ireland about a quarter of a billion pounds per year. And they're now saying, well, now these green lanes and red lanes that come into place, by actually accepting the paperwork, it is still putting off other companies trading inside Northern Ireland because of the cost of the paperwork. And they're also saying, well, if you have to show paperwork to come into Northern Ireland, well, then that confirms that Northern Ireland is a separate state from the rest of the UK. And it really comes down to the protocol and how it was put together. And of course, the protocol really is a trade deal. It's an international trade deal, and it's designed to protect this, the integrity of the European single market. But they expect Britain to do the hard work for that, to make the sacrifices for that. And unionists are refusing to go into government here because they say that the protocol destroys the Good Friday Agreement, because it keeps us outside and away from the UK. Well, of course, any trade deal, what they're trying to do is align the finances of the Republic of Ireland with Northern Ireland. They're trying to have an all-in-one economy, which will make sense if you're trying to protect the single market. The problem with unionism sees with that, of course, is where you get financial alignment, you very, very quickly get political alignment. And with the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement arriving in April, Joe Biden wanting to attend the celebrations. And of course, there now is no Good Friday Agreement and not looking as if that will happen unless these talks are successful. Hi, what are the chances of that? Well, under legislation, by the 19th of January, Chris Heaton Harris, the Secretary of State, will have to call an election to happen sometime in early April. If not, he will have to extend that legislation and continue with direct rule. So it's all to play for today, but this is only the start of a series of talks that are about to happen. Keir Starmer here tomorrow, and of course, the Taoiseach Leo Varadka also in Belfast tomorrow to try and push those talks forward. 
OK, thank you, Dougie. Dougie Beatty there in Belfast. We've all got our fingers crossed they can come to some sort of resolution. My goodness, it feels like they need to sort it out, don't they? Right, now, um, some people would say these are shocking figures from the Office of National Statistics, but some of us have known about this for the whole of 2022, frankly. Uh, excess deaths in 22 were the worst, among the worst, in 50 years. There are all sorts of reasons why these might be happening and we frankly have got to put a lot more resources into working out why. The Times are now reporting that there are a thousand excess deaths each week. Well, one man who has been uh, shouting about this for a lot longer than 24 hours is uh, Jamie Jenkins, Stats Jamie on Twitter. Great to see you, Jamie, former head of statistics at the Office of National Statistics. Now, I don't know about you, but when I saw the BBC saying that these figures have, are inspiring a brand new debate, prompting a new debate, what was your reaction to that? Well, well shocking, to be honest with you, Bev, because like I say, I've been talking about this for, for at least six months. I've been on with your colleagues, Mark Stein and Dan Mutton, talking about it back in the summer. It's not a new debate. I, you know, I've been highlighting this to some of the prominent journalists of the BBC, and there's been pretty much silence from them. But um, it's finally we start to see a lot of the kind of the media waking up to what's going on. So let me just explain to the to the viewers and those listening on the radio what what we mean. Then, so excess deaths is where you can look at how many deaths would you expect to see across the country. Uh, and because we've had this pandemic the last couple of years, we normally take those years out and let's look at 2015 to 2019. Now we do have a large cohort of people in the population who were born just after the Second World War, the post-war baby boomers, who are kind of hitting that age now where they're reaching probably life expectancy. So rather than just look at numbers, you can look at the kind of the probability of dying before the pandemic and then apply that to how many people we've got in the population now. And if we do that, 2022 is pretty much a tale of kind of two parts. We had the first 17, 18 weeks of the year where deaths were below what you'd expect. And then from around about weeks 18, 19 now, the last 34 weeks, we've seen deaths above what you'd expect. Now, it's running at about 560 per week over that period. I think you've talked about 1,000 deaths mm -hmm. that some of the media are talking about. That's in part because we've got more kind of older people now. So if you adjust for that, there's still that issue. And, and when you dig underneath that headline number of how many deaths overall and start looking at it by age, if you take out COVID, because we know there's been a couple of waves of COVID throughout the summer and the autumn months, it's predominantly the excesses among people aged 35 to 54, which is obviously concerning because the years of life lost for those individuals is much higher than if obviously people are dying uh, at an elderly age. Do we know why, Jamie, at the moment? Are there, who, who is actually looking? That's, in fact, that's probably a better question. Who is charged with finding out what is causing these excess deaths and are they doing a good job of it? Well, that's a very good question. So when I was on with them, um, with Dan on his evening show back in August, I think he put a call in to the Department for Health and they said that they'd called for an investigation. So that was August. We're now into January and we're not really cl much clearer. We've got kind of, I think some parts of um, kind of some of the unions and things are saying that obviously a lot of this to do with NHS delays and they've put a number out. But then the NHS England have said that they don't recognise that number. So there's going to be a multitude of different factors at play. Some people talk about the fact that if you've had a COVID infection, that could be a factor long, in the longer term. Some people have talked about the vaccination rollout, and that could be a factor. Uh, some people talk about the NHS problems that we've got. That could be a factor. There's a multitude of factors. But what the government should have is they know all the people who've died. They will have their patient record and their pathway through the NHS if they were on a waiting list, if there was a delay, if they had, you know, if they should know their COVID status for most people who've had a COVID positive test and the low vaccination status. So a lot of all of these different things that are in the mix, if, if the data was out there and made available, not just from the government, but there's lots of analysts like myself, not just me or across the country has been kind of crunching numbers over the last couple of years. Let's put all the numbers out there and let's have a proper look at it and then we can perhaps open up what's really going on. Mm. Absolutely. The thing is, Jamie, I've been watching Incredulous on other, for, at other media channels. As you say, GB News, the People's Channel, we are the only channel that seems to be bothered about whether people are alive or dead at the moment, it often seems. And the other channels are not going near this. Now, is that because they spent so much time in the pandemic encouraging lockdowns, asking for more restrictions, a national health service devoted to COVID? It's quite awkward for some of those channels 
to now come out and say this might be collateral damage from the very uh, movement, the very policies that we were we were cheering for. How do they handle that from a media point of view? And that is a very good point, because if you do look at the, the figures and you start looking at, say, A&E attendance as well, when the, the calls were saying stay home, protect the NHS, some people would argue that what, what they were meaning is to stay at home if you were in, have, you know, to avoid infecting others. You should yeah. have gone to the NHS. But that's not what the kind of the public took it, because the yeah. figures are quite stark. The loads of people didn't turn up into the NHS. The A&E attendances fell off a cliff. So people generally did say stay home, don't you know, protect the NHS, just avoid the NHS, don't put any pressure on us. And that's where we've got now 7.2 million people on waiting lists in England. We've got record numbers in Wales. Um, and it's not what, when you start looking at calls as well, Bev, what you can see is that um, when you start looking at how many deaths you'd expect from different causes, you know, the Office for Health um, Improvement and Disparities, they're kind of citing from their data that is linked to kind of heart issues. You look at the waiting list for heart issues now, they've increased 50% the number of people who are waiting for treatment for heart issues on the NHS. It was 233,000 in February 2020. It's now over 340,000. So it's gone up 50%. So there will be people on these waiting lists who are probably dying before they're getting to see somebody, but also people who are dying before they're actually getting to, you know, to be on the waiting list in the first place. Mm, it's really, it's genuinely so shocking. And, and entirely predictable for those of us who were shouting that if you keep everybody at home, you make us eat more, uh, drink more, move less, become more sedentary and not go and, let's say, have a check up on the anomalous lump you might have and you gave cancer a six month run. The, the, the consequences of this are serious. They are human. They are tragic. Uh, Stats, Jamie, thank you. Jamie Jenkins there. Thank you so much uh, for, for bringing us up to speed with that. Now, don't forget uh, to vote in our Twitter poll this morning. We're asking you that the BBC, given the BBC, have uh, allowed Shamima Begum a platform to tell her story. It's a 10-part podcast. Should she have this, this ability to make her story known? It's very controversial. 92% of you say no, she should shush. Uh, send us an email as well, gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. Now, after the break, I'm going to talk to my panellists, Sam Lister and Mike Parry, on the day's biggest stories. But first, here's the weather. Hello, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. There will be some bright or sunny spells today, especially in the east of the UK, but more rain on the way for many in the form of showers or longer spells of rain, mostly affecting western areas. We've got this strong westerly airflow at the moment. The strongest of the winds that we saw across the north of Scotland overnight are easing. The isobars opening out a little, but it stays blustery across the UK through the day, and that wind will bring in further heavy showers, hail, thunder, a possibility, and some of the showers merging to form longer spells of rain, especially for parts of Wales in the southwest and then into central England by the end of the afternoon. Uh, best of any brighter spells will be towards the east, but even here there'll be some showers. And temperatures back to around average, eight or nine generally across England and Wales, five or six or seven for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Into the evening, the rain ramps up again and the wind across Wales and the southwest in particular and around southwestern shores, coastal gales at 60 mile per hour wind gusts. A calmer and clearer night for northern Scotland where a frost will form minus three or minus four in some sheltered glens and a bright start for northern Scotland, some showers in the far north here. But elsewhere, a lot of cloud and further outbreaks of rain for Northern Ireland as well as Western Scotland through the morning and Wales in the southwest. Concerns here because of the large amount of rain falling on saturated ground, especially for Bracken Beacons and uh, Exmoor. Now the rain will move through, followed by showers. It's a mild but blustery day in the south. Temperatures closer to average further north. And uh, the rain as it pushes into central Scotland will fall as snow above 400 metres, perhaps affecting some higher routes. So it's cold for parts of Scotland and increasingly so heading into Thursday night. Milder further south, but all areas turning colder into the weekend with further heavy showers, but also some sunny spells.
Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <laughs> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. This year on GB News, we've got brand new members in the family. Join us across the entire United Kingdom. We cover the issues that matter to you. GB News will always stay honest, balanced and fair. We want to hear whatever is on your mind. And we don't talk down to you. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. Britain's watching. Come join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. My name's Tom Harvard and join me 9.30 a.m. every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harvard, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Good morning, welcome back to Bev Turner today on GB News. Thank you very much for finding us. Not everybody does, but when you do, you love us. So tell your mates if you like what we do. Uh, let me introduce you to my guest this morning. I'm delighted to be joined back here at the Breakfast Bar with the political editor of the Daily Express, Sam Lister, and broadcaster and journalist. Rent a gob, Mike Parry. You don't mind being called a rent a gob, do you, Mike? I think it's a bit harsh, but I've been called worse. <laughs> now, Mike, the Church of England yeah. will spend a hundred million quid in a bid to atone for its historical links to the yeah. slave trade. Yes. Yeah. Go on. What do you make of this? Well, it's curing their own conscience uh, by paying uh, for their what, crimes of their past. I tell you what, uh, they're a very wealthy organisation, the Church of England, mm. and I wish they'd spend a lot more of their own money trying to get people back into churches, OK? Now, in this country, mosques are regularly full. Do you know why that is? Because people of the Muslim faith believe in their faith, they want to worship, they want to demonstrate their commitment to their beliefs. Why isn't that being promoted in Christianity? I wish the Archbishop of Canterbury would spend as much time trying to get people back into churches as he does about mouthing off about every other social, usually left-leaning issue in this country. As for slavery, I hope they're not going to, you know, brainwash us and say it was all our fault. We abolished slavery, uh, slavery in 1807 and we freed 150,000 potential slaves from the ships we then captured off the coast of Africa. We are the country that led to the abolition of slavery. Yeah. I don't believe we've got any more guilt in our history than any other country in the world, because for three centuries, 16th, 17th and 18th, slavery was an endemic part of the world. Take it back to its logical beginning, and you would never go and visit the Colosseum. In Rome, or the 
pyramids in Egypt because they were built by slaves. Yeah, well, apparently the church has researched uh, funds that managed by the church commissioners found that some wealth, wealth, some wealth originally came from investments in firms running the slave trade, as well as donations from slave traders, including Edward Colston. If you remember, he was the statue in Bristol that was toppled at the height yep. of Black Lives Matter process. This, this kind of story, Sam, uh, it really troubles me because you could trace any mm. money back to any sort of mildly unethical yeah. origin, can't yeah. you? Of course. And I'm amazed the church have got 100 million... Well, not amazed, the church is very wealthy, but mm. I'm amazed that they're choosing to spend their 100 million quid on this. Mm. Whereas, like Mike said, there surely must be better ways to spend this money. Well, this, I mean, this is the thing. It's, it's one of our um, pieces in the leader column today in our paper, and we're, we're saying, actually, a lot of churches do not feel like they're part of a wealthy organisation. No, because they, they are scraping and scrimping and... Vickers Crumbling. Have, yeah, they have, they have a number of churches to cover now. They don't just have one that, you know, they, they have five or six to cover. They, they, they have to pay a certain amount to um, central coffers and that can be a massive burden for a local church that has a very small congregation. Mm. Yeah. So they do not feel like they're a wealthy organisation and when this kind of money is being spent and also you've got to work, how do they work out how much money atones for this past sin, you know? Yeah. How have they come up with this figure and is, yeah. that, is that the end of it and does that yeah. then clear the slate and there's so yeah. many questions and, and, around this. And they don't actually explain what they're going to spend this hundred million on. No. As you quite rightly say, Sam, they could yeah. build half a dozen church schools. Yeah. That, you know, they could recruit thousands of more people to spread the word of Christianity. Mm. They, they, they could rebuild Christianity as a faith in this country. Yeah. It's a ludicrous amount of money on something which yeah. they haven't even specified yeah. what they're going to do. Yeah. Now, listen, some, some very breaking news. Mm -hmm. This isn't even on the news uh, websites yet. Tory MP Andrew Bridgen, he has been suspended over his COVID vaccine comments. Now, if you aren't familiar with the work that Andrew Bridgen has been doing, he has very much been in contact with vaccine-injured people. He was at an all-party parliamentary group uh, meeting. I was also there hearing the stories from those who are vaccine-injured, and he's been trying to raise awareness of this. He's been working closely with Dr Asim Molhatra and his findings as a cardiologist and looking at his clinically peer-reviewed papers to say that the vaccines are now doing more harm than good. What do you make of him losing the whip, Mike? Um... Was it for one specific comment? Well, or... it is still breaking now at the yeah. moment. Apparently, um, it's a bit hard to find the information. Here we go. Yep. Somebody is handing me a piece yep. of paper. Thank you. Has his Tory whip removed after causing great offence with remarks on COVID vaccines and Holocaust? Mm -hmm. Apparently, he claimed that COVID vaccines are causing serious harm and said it was the biggest crime against humanity since the Holocaust. Mm. Tory Chief Whip Simon Hart has said Andrew Bridgen has crossed a line causing great offence in the process. As a nation, we should be very proud of what has been achieved through the vaccine programme. The vaccine is the best defence against COVID that we have. Misinformation about the vaccine causes harm and costs lives. I'm therefore removing the whip from Andrew Bridgen with immediate effect pending a formal investigation. Mm. Wow. I, I, th I think um, I don't see any great offence there in that quote, the biggest crime against humanity since the Holocaust. He's merely saying that, in his opinion, it's a, an horrendous situation that's taken place, but it's not a Holocaust denier or anything no. like that. However... Once you start bringing the word Holocaust into any argument whatsoever, yeah. it is the greatest crime in the history of the world yeah. and you're going to put yourselves right up there to be shot down. Yeah. Yeah, Sam, what do you make I of agree. It? I, th I think once you go down that ro road, you are opening yourself up to a, a whole world of trouble and, and there is just no need to raise the Holocaust in, in no, exactly. relation to COVID. It's, it's, you know, it, just, it is offensive to people. It, but he's basically being sacked for a simile. Yeah, no, that is true. That, if you look Although at it like I think that, actually, it's comparison. Of yeah. course, it, it, you know, and some might say yeah. it's still early days. We have no long-term data. The yeah. numbers are still coming in with vaccine harms. And he is certainly working hard with those individuals who are trying to uh, also to claim the money that they're owed mm. from the government. Because, of course, remember, the pharmaceutical companies were immune against any claims. But, d d but, go on, Mike. Yeah, what, what I was going to say is, Beth, you're absolutely right. A simile, and that's what he's been yeah. done for. But I'm afraid, even as a simile, it tends to trivialise yeah. the Holocaust. Yeah. Because no matter how bad it gets with COVID, yeah. no matter how many yeah. thousands die, no matter how many millions die, in the end, if it's shown to have been a completely, you know, wrong policy, it's never going to be as bad no. as the Holocaust.
Right. You, you wonder what he's really being sacked for, though. I mean, they are saying that it's he's misinformation. I, I've been watching very closely what MP Andrew Bridgen has been saying, and I don't see it as misinformation. I see him as one of very few voices trying to make uh, a claim for the people who've been injured. But anyway, that's the breaking news. But, um, but, but the, the Tory MP does say crossing a line causing great offence in the process. Yeah. It's clearly a direct result of mentioning the word Holocaust. Yeah, yeah. yeah. OK. Right, after the break, my panellists Sam Lister and Mike Perry will be back for one more round of uh, news analysis before PMQ start. But first, here's your morning news with, with Tatiana. Bev, thank you very much. Let's start with some breaking news that you've just been hearing in the last... Ten minutes or so, Conservative MP Andrew Bridgen has had the whip removed following his criticism of the COVID vaccination programme. The chief whip, Simon Hart, says Mr Bridgen has crossed a line causing great offence in the process. He says misinformation about the vaccine causes harm and costs lives. Mr Hart removed the whip from Mr Bridgen with immediate effect pending a formal investigation. Now up to 25,000 ambulance workers across England and Wales are striking today over pay. Paramedics, drivers and call handlers from the Unison and GMB unions are taking part in 24-hour walkouts. Health unions say they won't submit evidence to the NHS pay review body for the next wage round while the current industrial disputes remain unresolved. Health Secretary Steve Barclay says despite contingency plans, there will be an impact on response times saying to people if they do face genuine life-threatening uh, issues then of course the response is to phone 999 but uh, if not then to be very mindful of the pressure on the system today clearly there's 111 which is there for urgent calls we were just asking people to be mindful of the significant pressure our ambulance service will be under today A rail union has warned its dispute is even further away from being resolved than when it started last year. The General Secretary of Aslev Union, Mick Whelan, told the Transport Select Committee on a scale of 1 to 10, the resolution of the situation was at zero. RMT's General Secretary, Mick Lynch, says he doesn't know if his members will accept profound changes to the rail industry. Hundreds of flights in and out of the US have been grounded and delayed after a mass computer outage. The Federal Aviation Administration say their system, which alerts pilots about hazards and relevant procedures, was not processing updated information. Now, this is a breaking story. We'll bring you more on this as we get it. And six people, including a police officer, have been attacked at the Gare du Nord train station in Paris by a man with a knife, leaving one person with major injuries. Police secured the area following the incident, which happened at around 6.45 local time this morning. Officers say the attacker was shot several times by police and taken to hospital with life-threatening injuries. The motivation is not yet known. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deeds & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. The guy went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. <laughs> we'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the center of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us again. You've been sending in lots of views this morning. Thank you about the nurses' strikes. Peter has said uh, a guest, that was you, Sam Lister, referred to the horrible time nurses had during COVID. Are these the same nurses who were dancing on TikTok, getting a pay rise, being able to work full time and worshipped by the media? <sighs> Our times have changed, hey? Uh, Michael also says if the government agree any pay increase for registered nurses, then it's the NHS Trust that will have to find the savings to pay for them. One diversity manager equals two to three nurses. Uh, on Prince Harry, Linda, this is interesting. Is nobody wondering about Archie and Lily? And when they're old enough to read this book full of bitterness and anger, what will it do to their futures? That is such a good point. Nobody's really been talking about their children in this. Uh, and James has said that it says a lot about the BBC that they are willing to give airtime and spend public money on Shamima Begum and her podcast, but not reinstate the national anthem on TV for the Queen's Jubilee last year. Right, guys, back to our stories. Um, Boris Johnson... Mm. Mike Parry. Yeah. He's living in a £20 million house. Brilliant. On one of the UK's most expensive streets. Does yeah. it matter? Is this, a, is this worthy of a front page on the mirror, do you think? Well, I mean, we all know where the mirror, mirror's politics lie, <laughs> and you've got to give them the credit. They brought down Boris Johnson because they did? their stories about Partygate started the ball rolling. It yeah. ended up with Boris exiting. Downing Street, so that's a clear mission. Now, there is, of course, talk about Boris coming back in May. I think that's what this is about, that, isn't that, it? Uh, that's what I'm about on. to say is, um, and, and I read a piece, a very influential piece the other day, saying the only thing that Keir Starmer really fears is the return of Boris, right? Yeah. And so could the mirror be going all over again? As for the actual story itself, it's ridiculous. It's the politics of envy. So he's got a mate. It, th this flat he lives in, £20 million, actually belongs to the wife, not even the Lord. Lord himself, Lord Bamford is mm. very wealthy billionaire okay. yeah. that produces all the Bamford, um, you know, engineering products. And it belongs to his wife. It's very near to Harrods, you know, the world's most famous shop. And he's staying there. He may not have anywhere to live at the moment because, of course, he's been ousted from Downing Street and Chequers. So maybe he stands apart. Now, the only issue I can see here is that he could be hiding the privilege that he's getting from yeah. borrowing his mate's flat. But frankly. Who doesn't want to live in a £20 million apartment? I do. Yeah. I certainly do. And it, so is the accusation, Sam, that he's not paying rent there and therefore he's not declaring the interest as, as an MP? It, it's the, the estimate of how much the value is of, yeah. of the, the house he's getting. So he's put into the Register of Members' Interest that it's worth um, £10,000 a month. The Mirror says one round the corner is worth £30,000 a month, so he's underestimating the value of the freebie he's getting and therefore that's a breach of the... The, the rules. Now, I think Mike and you are both absolutely spot on. I think we're going to see a lot more of this yeah. stuff coming up because both Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer are terrified of a Boris Johnson comeback. Mm. And there's a big wing of the Conservative Party who desperately want that to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, there's going to be a lot of people trying to stop that. Yeah. Uh, and you're going to see stories uh, to this effect trying to make sure that he, he does not return. Yeah, fascinating, isn't mm. it? Yeah. Mm. Really, he really won't go away, will he? Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of people don't want him to. That's no. true. Oh, right. Well, um, he belongs in this £20 million apartment, Boris, doesn't he? You know what I mean? I right. think we all do, Mike yeah. Harris. Yeah. Where do we want him to live, you know? Yeah. We all love to live yeah. in a £20 million yeah. apartment. Yeah. Right, King, King Charles to use first state to visit to France to strengthen post-Brexit ties. Uh, we know that Prince Charles is set to travel to Paris just before Easter yeah. on the invitation of President Emmanuel Macron. What significance will this trip have, Mike? Is he going to build our bridge with our, with our French well, friends? Well, uh, Sam will know a lot more 
more about this than me and the internal politics of it all. But the the idea that it's going to, you know, um, strengthen bonds because of Brexit and all that has been floated, actually, by the French paper La Parisienne, because they, of course, would like us to be back in Europe. Mm. They've always hated us for coming out. And yeah. Mr Macron has been very unhelpful in the way that we've tried to handle the division of our countries after um, Brexit. And so it's, it, Le Parisien is saying Charles is coming here to build bridges and all that. I do think it's very significant that it's, it'll be the king's first overseas visit. Yeah. It is to France. But if there'd never been a Brexit, I believe Charles would have done that as well. He's always believed in very strong ties with France and with our continental neighbours. Yeah. So, so I think it's a political interpretation. But as I say, Sam will know how far the king is allowed to go to impress upon us the political goodness of it all. It's, I mean, that's it. You, you know, as king, he cannot get, in, he cannot dip his toe into that row. You know, it, it just he has to rise above that. But just the very fact of him going, that is building relations now. Rishi Sunak, he is trying to reset the relationship mm. with France uh, since he took over. I think he gets on quite well with Emmanuel Macron. Yeah. And obviously That's we had right. quite... Yeah. <laughs> And it was quite a difficult year in... Uh, Two in... tiny little men <laughs> with so much power. Well, that's it. I mean, they've got huge amounts of power, and uh, so they seem to get on. And um, But I think this is... It, it's a symbolic thing, isn't it? Yeah. And it's about, um, you know, look, they've got the uh, yeah. Elysee Palace, a state dinner. Mm. It's, it's a... It's a, it's a it's and, a of course, he'll thing. have all the Harry stuff hanging over him everywhere <laughs> he goes for months now. Right, mm. Matt Hancock, <laughs> talking about things that won't go away. Matt Hancock, he, he's gone to Turkey. And, and what is the speculation, Mike Perry? Why is he in Turkey? Well, there is some speculation. He's gone for a hair transplant. Now, uh, <laughs> if, you, if you'd like to look at my bonnet, so to speak... You oh, know, it's lovely. I have, I have thought over the years about doing it myself. And, in fact, <laughs> I went to see the guy who gave Wayne Rooney a hair transplant. Did you? Yes, in Harley Street in London. And just decided, then, it wasn't for me. It's... it's it, do you know what this is? This is Matt Hancock now paying the penalty for the shocking vanity he showed over the last sort of 12, 18, yeah. uh, two years. We all saw him in the jungle, and he, he's a very vain man. So I don't think there's any admission there it's going to happen, but... I don't. The general public would say I wouldn't put it past him, you know. What What do you think? I think I think this was just like a bit of a, a social media flyer. Somebody spotted him going to put two and two together. Mm. Yeah. But really, what I think is interesting is the fact that he then went on TikTok um, and did a little video about it and all these yeah. puns, you know, about uh, this story's got no teeth. It's hair today, gone tomorrow. Mm. Now, you know, he clearly loves still being in the press. <laughs> it doesn't matter if oh, it's. Right. Um, I'm you pointing know. the spotlight at yeah. himself yeah. as well. Yeah, I'd advise so. him against it. Not I've got anything against. Turkey, but yeah. you just mentioned Turkish teeth, OK? And 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 there is a, a thing, isn't there, that people are going abroad to get yes. cheap dental treatment yes. or cheap plastic surgery, and then having to come back here and asking the NHS to sort of fix things, yeah. you know, with no disrespect to the countries they go to. So, you know, as a, as a still an MP, he, he'd have yeah. to go to the National Health and Service. And, of course, remember, you know, he did, he did I'm a Celebrity, but he'd filmed SAS Who Dares yeah. Wins before that, so we've still got to be subjected to that <laughs> on the telly. Yeah. Uh, right, we've been asking you on Twitter this morning, should the BBC give Shamima Begum a platform to tell her side of the story in this new podcast? It's ten hours of it. According to our Twitter poll, 92% of you say no. This, this uh, podcast should not be broadcast by the BBC. Right, we've got to the end of the show. It's flown by again. Thank you so much, Mike Parry, uh, Sam Lister. Coming up next is GB News Live with Stephen Dixon. I'm Bev Turner. I'll see you tomorrow morning at 10. Hello, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. There will be some bright or sunny spells today, especially in the east of the UK, but more rain on the way for many in the form of showers or longer spells of rain mostly affecting western areas. We've got this strong westerly airflow at the moment. The strongest of the winds that we saw across the north of Scotland overnight are easing. The isobars opening out a little, but it stays blustery across the UK through the day, and that wind will bring in further heavy showers. Hail, thunder, a possibility, and some of the showers merging to form longer spells of rain, especially for parts of Wales in the southwest and then into central England by the end of the afternoon. Uh, best of any brighter spells will be towards the east, but even here there'll be some showers. And temperatures back to around average, eight or nine generally across England and Wales, five or six or seven for Scotland and Northern Ireland. 
into the evening, the rain ramps up again and the wind across Wales and the southwest in particular and around southwestern shores, coastal gales at 60 mile per hour wind gusts. A calmer and clearer night for northern Scotland where a frost will form minus three or minus four in some sheltered glens and a bright start for northern Scotland. Some showers in the far north here, but elsewhere a lot of cloud and further outbreaks of rain for Northern Ireland as well as Western Scotland through the morning and Wales in the southwest. Concerns here because of the large amount of rain falling on saturated ground, especially for Bracken Beacons and uh, Exmoor. Now the rain will move through, followed by showers. It's a mild but blustery day in the south. Temperatures closer to average further north. And uh, the rain as it pushes into central Scotland will fall as snow above 400 metres, perhaps affecting some higher routes. So it's cold for parts of Scotland and increasingly so heading into Thursday night. Milder further south, but all areas turning colder into the weekend with further heavy showers, but also some sunny spells.